Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to MOS Live and happy National Chemistry Week. My name is Emily, my pronouns are she, her, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your observations and questions today. Today, we are closing out our week of chemistry activities by talking with an extra special guest scientist and seeing some of his famous chemistry demonstrations. Thank you for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook or YouTube. <coughs> but please note that we are not able to share your comments with our educator at this time. For everyone here on Zoom, just go ahead and press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your observations and questions. Don't forget to include your name and age if you'd like a shout out. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. I would now like to invite our special guest scientist to turn on his video, come on screen, introduce himself, and we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special event celebrating National Chemistry Week. You know, every week is National Chemistry Week, but today we have a special program for you. And I promise you a good time if you pay attention. Pay close attention because we live in a beautiful, complex chemical world, and I'm going to be mixing a lot of different chemicals. In fact, some of them I'm going to be uh, showing you by uh, <clears throat> uh, asking uh, Emily to uh, share a video clip from here on. What we have here is a long glass tube. This tube has in it a gas called nitric oxide. It's a colorless gas, so we can't see it. It also has in it some liquid called carbon disulfide. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to step on this stool. I'm going to light a match and drop and remove the stopper and drop the match in there. All right? So let me do that this way. And I'm going to do this experiment in the dark. So if we can turn the lights off, here it comes. Now you be very attentive about this. Strike the match, lift the rubber stopper off. You see, you see, you see that inside this tube now we have some yellow substance, which is sulfur that came from the carbon disulfide. This is a highly exothermic reaction in that it releases energy, except that the energy that's released now was in the form of light. You saw that big flash. And also in the form of sound, right? So let's take a look at this now in slow motion and see if we can learn more about this system. Uh, you'll see me now bringing the match up near the top of the tube. I'll lift the rubber stopper off and drop it. There I am trying to get out of the way. <laughs> and you see that fabulous, fantastic chemical reaction taking place. There are so many different experiments that can be done safely. Safety is paramount in everything that I do. There are other experiments that we can do at home. You and I can do at home. We'll get to those in a, in a, in a, in a minute, actually a little longer than a minute. Uh, but now what I would like to do is show you another clip where we use dry ice and mix it. Well, let's see what happens. But what I have in this bucket here is some carbon dioxide, except it's not in the gaseous form. It is in the solid form. It's called dry ice. So I put my gloves on, and I try now to get a chunk of dry ice and set it right here. This is solid carbon dioxide. It is at a temperature of minus 78 degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold. And that's why I wear the gloves. This solid is changing into a gas directly without melting. When a solid changes from being a solid to a gas without melting, we call that sublimation. Can you say sublimation? Sublimation. Sublimation is happening right now, but we can't see it. How come we can't see it? Because carbon dioxide gas is mixing with air, which itself is a mixture of gases. 
I want to ask you to focus your attention on what you see between my two hands right here. What shape are these objects? Cylinders. cylinders. And how many cylinders are there? Six. Six. And they have in them what looks like colored liquids. We know they're liquids because from experience, we know what liquids do when we shake them up. And they seem to be arranged in some kind of order. This pair has what color liquid? Blue. This one. Yay. This one. Purple. All right, so what I'm going to do now in this experiment, I'm going to take chunks of dry ice, and I'm going to drop them into these cylinders, and we'll see what happens as I drop the dry ice in every other cylinder, not in every cylinder. Does this help see it better? All right. Do you see bubbles? Those are carbon dioxide bubbles coming from the sublimation of dry ice. We see them there because a gas is mixing with liquid. Over here, we don't see them because gas is mixing with air. We also see beautiful color changes, right? And we see something coming off the top here. It looks like smoke, but it's not really smoke. It is a mist. It is the condensation of water vapor on the cold carbon dioxide gas that's coming from the sublimation process. But some of the carbon dioxide gas dissolved in the liquid and caused the color changes. So each of these pairs had in them dyes, and these dyes change color depending on how acidic or basic a substance is. To begin with, all the cylinders had in them a basic substance and different dyes, three different dyes. And then when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, as we have in carbonated beverages, we get carbonic acid. We drink carb carbonic acid, it's safe to do. But you see the color changes are because of the acid-base reaction that we have used, and these dyes, when they change color, they indicate to us that a reaction has taken place. That's why they're called acid-base indicators. They indicate a chemical change. Do you like this experiment? Yeah! Thank you. You could see in this experiment the bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. That tells us that carbon dioxide gas is not very soluble. It doesn't dissolve very much in water, but a tiny little bit dissolves and causes the color changes. You also saw something near the top of each cylinder, uh, the, the mist. That, that is condensed water vapor. And, and, and carbon dioxide gas is a greenhouse gas. So is water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. In the next clip, but then uh, I want I would like Emily to uh, to show you now. Well, let's see what it what what it has uh, in it. Let's see. And I'm going to do an experiment with uh, the hot boiling liquid that I have here. The one that I have here is uh, water. I'm going to use my gloves now to protect my hands from heat. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and I have some dry ice here, but actually I'm missing, whoops, I'm missing, I'm missing a dishpan. Let's see if I can find it. Could someone please bring me the dishpan? Would someone please bring me? <laughs> Hello, Bucky. <laughs> Good to see you, Bucky. And welcome to my lab. Thank you. This is what I really wanted to do. So, so Bucky, would you like to help me with this experiment? You notice that Bucky is a good science student. He's wearing his eye protection. I want everyone to see that. And so, Bucky, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the boiling water. I'm going to put it in this dishpan that you brought me. And what we see coming off the top here, what does it look like? Steam is invisible. You can't see steam. We see a mist. That's what we're seeing. The mist of water vapor, and then Bucky, here's the experiment. You take this bucket right here, and you pour all the dry ice that's in there into the boiling water. Go ahead, Bucky. Do it, all the way, all the way. Uh, 
That was very, very nice, Bucky. Does that look like steam? No. It is, it looks like fog. Looks like fog, and that's what it is. We just made a lot of fog here. You notice that the fog is moving downward now because carbon dioxide gas is denser than air. The condensation is on the carbon dioxide gas that's coming from the sublimation reaction. So you, you, you saw that the fog is formed on the carbon dioxide gas and, and that's coming from the sublimation. And both carbon dioxide gas and water vapor are greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases affect the temperature uh, that we have on the, on the planet. Actually, greenhouse gases are good for us. If it were not for greenhouse gases, the temperature on the surface of uh, the planet would be very, very cold. And life as we know it would not exist. But too much of anything is not good. And that's why we all have to be careful about our dependence, our over-dependence on the use of fossil fuels as a source of energy, because when we burn fossil fuels, we produce carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide and water vapor react in nature. And that's what I wanna show you in the next slide. Next slide, please, Emily. This is a slide taken in Madison, where I live in Madison, Wisconsin. You see the beautiful color changes that are occurring. I know you have them in New England and elsewhere uh, around the country, almost elsewhere, uh, everywhere else around the country. These color changes occur in the fall because the green pigments that are, <clears throat> are made of chlorophyll, uh, the changes in temperature, Oh, that's beautiful. And, and I, I, I remember traveling throughout New England in the, in the Boston area and around the Boston area and seeing these fascinating, dazzling color changes. <clears throat> Always wanted to know, why does this happen? It happens because we are putting carbon, go back, Emily one, if you, uh, we, because we're putting, um, because the carbon dioxide and uh, water vapor combine in the process we call photosynthesis and the giant factories that produce the green pigment in the leaves begin to slow down and eventually shut down as the temperature goes down and as the amount of moisture in the atmosphere decreases and also the amount of sunlight. So we have chemical changes occurring in nature all the time, but we need to be careful about our own over dependence on the use of fossil fuels for um, a source of energy. The amount of carbon dioxide due to human activity is increasing. That's the next slide I'd like to show you. <clears throat> this is the amount of carbon dioxide in the air as measured on the top of an observatory uh, on a tall mountain in Hawaii. And you can see since 1960, the graph easily shows us that the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing. And if you, if you like to look at graphs, and I like to interpret graphs too, you can think about why the variations are even. Why is it up and down, up and down? Why isn't it it's a smooth straight line? It's almost a smooth straight line. So we learn in science uh, <clears throat> uh, how to get answers to questions that we have, but please ask questions. All, ask questions all the time and be patient as you, the, as you think about the questions that you uh, want answers to and uh, don't look for an instantaneous reaction. Always, always be careful about the questions that you ask. Uh, <clears throat> if you just come back to me now, um, Emily, because I want to share with you a story, <clears throat> a short story about how I got interested in science. I grew up in my native Lebanon and my mother knitted a sweater for me. It was a yellow sweater. And I wanted to know what yellow is. So I asked her and she said, well, it's made of wool. I said, well, wool comes from sheep and sheep are not yellow. I kept on asking questions and my parents and my teachers were very encouraging to me. I was curious about all kinds of different things that occur in nature. Why is the sky blue? Why is it when the wind blows on a body of water, like the Mediterranean Sea or the Atlantic Ocean or the Charles River, why is it that we see white caps? And is the color of those white caps related to 
the color of the stuff that floats up in the sky. We ask questions all the time. So please be patient when you ask a question and don't get frustrated if you don't get the answer right away because the joy of learning is to try to figure out what is actually <clears throat> happening and why it is that we like to do experiments. So my next slide, please. Do you always believe what you see? Do you? Think about it. So what I'd like to do now is show you an experiment. This experiment, I have a glass that has water in it. It's actually carbonated water. I don't know, can you see the bubbles? Tiny little bubbles? Uh, maybe not, it doesn't matter. It can be just uh, pure water. And what I'm going to do is take a card that has two arrows on it. And then I'm going to, let me do this the right way, because this is an experiment you can do at home. Um, so you can take this and what's happening to the arrow? Emily, can you see? Put it down a little bit further. And let's see if our audience has any ideas. Go ahead and put in the Q&A if you see what's happening to the arrow. So the two arrows are pointing in the same direction, but when I lower the card, the lower arrow now is pointing what? Everyone is saying that it turned around. It flipped. It's turned it's around. Well, wow. okay. So that's why I say to you, do you always believe what you see? So we need to think about that. Actually, most of you, if not all of you, have had experience with this. When uh, in, in the summertime, when you're at the swimming pool, you put your leg in the water, does it look straight or does it look crooked? If you take a pencil and put it in a glass of water or in a, in a cup that has water in it, you can see that it looks bent. So always think about the observations that you make and ask questions. And don't get frustrated if you don't get the answer right away. Now, here's another. Doctor, yes. before you move on, do you mind if we ask a question? Please. We have a question here asking, okay, so we saw that the arrow turned around, but why? Well, that's the question I'm asking you to think about. If, if you're expecting me to give you all the answers or an answer, I'll be robbing you of the joy of asking questions and finding out the answers. So I want you to think about what it is that the water is doing to what you see. This is, the, so try this experiment at home and think about what is happening to the uh, to come up with the explanation for it. It 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 it's it's an illusion. What this is, it's a, it's a it's a kind of an illusion. You know, we, you know about illusions, right? You know about the rainbow. The rainbow is an illusion. There are all kinds of uh, illusions. Specifically, let me mention two that you can think about: an optical illusion and a visual illusion. And what's the difference between those two? And if you really want to learn more about this, please visit my website, scifun.org, S-C-I-F-U-N.org. When you go to my website, in the upper left corner, you can click on experiments you can do at home. And not only will you find this experiment, but you'll find a lot of other experiments that relate to illusions. And you find other experiments that relate to all kinds of different things. So, so you think about the question that you asked me and see if you can come up with a, a good explanation for that. Thank you. All right, well, here's another experiment I wanna show you. Let's see, you see this bottle that I'm holding here? Can you see that it has colored, it has a liquid in it. It also has colored beads. Uh, the beads on top are yellow and the beads on the bottom are white. So what I'm going to do is shake this. And now remember folks, put your observations in the Q and A. And you see that the, um, well, I'm not going to give you a play by play description. You should be making the observations. And if you pay attention, as I told you at the beginning, if you pay attention, you can learn a lot. And uh, you can now see that the beads are going back to where they were before. 
the yellow bead, let's shake up one more time. The yellow beads go to the top when the liquid is shaken and the white beads go to the bottom. And if you pay attention, you can see the movement of the beads. They're kind of like each other. They want to be with each other. Actually, beads have no feelings, you know that. Um, this is a fun experiment. It's good for kids of all ages. Now, let me wait here until it drops to the bottom. Um, someone is noticing that, so someone noticed that the beads separated to the opposite sides of the bottle and now they're coming back together. Yes. Same observation. Yes. Someone else is predicting that maybe this has something to do with density. Maybe, yes. And, and, and maybe it has to do with density. Maybe it has to do with, with the liquid that's in there. On my website, there are specific instructions for you to prepare this type of bottle uh, using the beads and using the liquid that's in there. I'll just say to you right now, it's not a single liquid that's in there. But I'll let you go to the website and visit because this is really a fun experiment for kids of all ages. Not only my three-year-old granddaughter here, but I know many, many adults, uh, grandparents who enjoy uh, uh, doing experiments at home. And so once again, I invite you to go to scifun.org, S-C-I-F-U-N.org. Does anyone and, have any predictions of what could be in the bottle? Do they know anything? Have they tried any experiments like this before? You can keep going for some, but I just wanted to add that in there. Let me know if you might have any ideas of what's in that bottle. We all should think about what we observe and try to make sense out of it. And if we, if we can't make sense out of it, just keep thinking about it and ask questions, have conversations with other people, and always, always be patient. Don't give up. Always be patient. There are all kinds of different observations that we make about things every, every day. Uh, the brain receives a lot of sensory information uh, through the eyes, through the ears, uh, through taste and smell, through touch. All of the sensory information is processed, but we have to think about what it is that we're seeing and we have to try to satisfy the curiosity that we have. And, and we have to share. Sharing with others is really, really important. That's why these home experiments should be done with others, uh, not only at home, uh, but with friends uh, and do them safely. Safety is paramount in everything we do. Remember now, and because of the virus, everyone should be wearing a mask when you are close to others who are not in your family. And make sure it's the proper kind of mask. It has a clip up here that fits very tightly so that we are protective, uh, not only for ourselves, but for, oh, very good, Emily, thank you. <laughs> everyone should do that. Um, did you have, did you, was there another question that you were gonna ask me? So um, we did have a few predictions thinking that there might be some oil and water in there. And we had one person, um, Gerard, who wanted to test out what would happen if we shook the bottle on its side. Shake the bottle on its side. So we get the bottle. You mean like this? Stir it like yeah. this? I do believe like that. I like questions. Wow. I like I like hearing from people what they're thinking. I like to think that each one of you is going to try different things with the experiment, this experiment and other experiments too, uh, that I suggest to you. So what I would like to do, in addition to going to my website for experiments you can do at home, you can find lots of other things there, but uh, they, we also have a YouTube channel. And on the, on the YouTube channel, um, you can find videos uh, a whole bunch of videos. Some are short, some are much longer. Uh, the longer ones are the ones from my annual program, Once Upon a Christmas Cheery in the Lab of Shaka Shiri. This is a program on PBS and it's shown around the country, uh, usually around Christmas time, but we have them posted on the YouTube channel so you can look there. But the shorter versions, uh, the shorter clips that we have there are also of interest to you. And that's what I'd like to show you uh, one of them right now. Hi, 
Have you ever seen this type of cleaner? It's used to clean bathroom tiles. So I'm actually standing in my tub in my bathroom and I'm going to do a few experiments with this. Watch what happens when I spray this on the wall. It goes on blue. It's a nice blue color. Let's sit here and watch. Do you notice the color fading over time? It looks a little white here. It still looks blue here. It sure looks to me like the color of blue is fading. Huh. I wonder how this color change happens. You know, let's do some experiments and find out. I wonder if there's something in the air that's causing the color change to blue. To test this idea, I'll spray the cleaner onto some aluminum foil. Next, I'll cover a portion of the foam with this plastic cup. The cup will prevent fresh air from reaching the foam that's covered by the cup. The portion of the foam that is not covered with the cup will interact with fresh air. Let's watch and see what happens. It looks to me like the foam is changing from blue to white just like before. I wonder what's happening under the cup. Hey look! The portion of the cup that was protected from the air is still blue. I think this is evidence that something in the air might be reacting with the foam to cause the color change. I wonder if it's carbon dioxide or CO2 that's causing the color change. We can test this idea by breathing through this straw under the foam. You see, carbon dioxide in exhaled breath is a hundred times more concentrated than it is in the air. So if carbon dioxide is causing the color change, my exhaled breath should do the trick a lot more quickly. Okay, let's spray two portions of cleaner onto the foil. Now I'll exhale through the straw onto this spot over here. Wow, the spot I breathed on changed color right away. Maybe carbon dioxide is causing the color change. I want to try another test. This home carbonation system pumps carbon dioxide into water to make sodas. First, I'll use this system to fill this bottle with CO2. There. This bottle should now be filled almost entirely with carbon dioxide. Now let's spray some foam onto the foil for our test. All right. Now we'll pour some of the carbon dioxide gas in this bottle onto the foam. Would you look at that? Pouring the carbon dioxide gas causes the foam to immediately change to completely white. That is really neat. I think we now have a lot of evidence that carbon dioxide is causing the color change. What causes this color change? Well, the cleaner contains a dye that's blue above pH 9, but colorless below this pH. You might remember that pH refers to how acidic or basic something is. Substances with a pH above 7 are basic, while those with a pH below 7 are acidic. The cleaner has a pH above 9, so the dye in the cleaner appears blue when it's first sprayed out. When the air contacts the cleaner, carbon dioxide in the air dissolves into the foam, and CO2 reacts rapidly with basic solutions. Carbon dioxide causes a drop in pH when it reacts with basic solutions. So when enough CO2 dissolves into the cleaner to cause the pH to drop below 9, the color changes from blue to white. Scientists have discovered that the amount of CO2 in the air is increasing. This extra CO2 builds up in the air when people burn various types of fuel, like gasoline, for energy. Just like carbon dioxide causes a drop in pH when it mixes into the foam, the CO2 in the air also gets into our oceans and makes the pH of the oceans drop. You can probably imagine that this drop in pH of the oceans is causing problems for sea life, and this may become a problem for the people who depend upon life in the oceans. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about this special cleaner and how carbon dioxide makes it change colors. Thanks so much for watching. I also thank you for watching, but I want to say to you something really, really important. <clears throat> it's one thing for me to do the experiment or for other people in my laboratory, as we just saw, do the experiment. It is you that should be doing the experiments because this is how we learned, by trying different things. And we always obey the safety rule. All the safety rules have to be obeyed in doing the experiments because we want to be learning about the beautiful, complex chemical world that we live in. Uh, we learn that every day, not only during National Chemistry Week, as I said before, every week is National Chemistry Week. So enjoy 
doing experiments. Please ask questions and always, always share the joy of what you have learned with others. And I want to thank you for um, visiting with me today. I'd like to show you my last slide and to remind you how you can uh, visit my website, scifun.org and browse around, visit at the bottom of the page. You can even send me questions uh, via an email address that's provided there. I usually answer all the questions except one. I will not help you with your homework problems. You have to do those yourselves. So thank you so much for joining and, and, and um, please enjoy the beautiful complex chemical world that we all live in. And thank you, Emily, and thank you, Museum of Science, for hosting this session. Of course, thank you so much. Now, we do have a couple more questions. Um, I know we're about over time, but I'd like to you know, take this opportunity while we have it to get some questions in. Um, so if you have any more questions or if you wanna share anything with us, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, so the first question we have from Sean, which was from all the way in the beginning of the show was asking, would the dry ice mist be hot or cold? Well, Sean, let's think about that. The, uh, the, car, the dry ice is minus 78 degrees Celsius and the water, the boiling water was at 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and uh, so the temperature of the mist, if you put your hand there, it will not feel warm at all. It feels a little, little cool. All right, thank you. And then we had a question from Thomas um, asking about the foam activity. And they ask, why doesn't the color blend into the color it was on? Why happen. doesn't the color blend into the color? I think the, potentially when it was on the foil. Oh, because it, because he cut he cut he covered it up, right, with the cup. Oh, they're asking: Is it always white? What is the base color? The base the foam starts out blue, but when it's exposed to air that has in it carbon dioxide, then it turns white. Great, thank you. Oh, and we have an interesting question here from Mrs. T. Why is carbon dioxide safe to eat, but not to breathe? I think they're thinking about in our drinks. With the Why is it what? Safe to what? Eat, but not breathe. Well, we, what, no. air is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen, and it is 21% um, um, uh, oxygen and uh, you know, 79% nitrogen, but carbon dioxide, this tiny amount is in there. If you, if you breathe more than the tiny amount that's in there, then uh, you can cause suffocation. So you have to be very careful about uh, 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 not only hyperventilation, but you have to also be careful about how much carbon dioxide you expose yourself to. Yes, we inhale uh, air and we exhale uh, uh, air, but what we exhale has in it uh, a carbon dioxide that comes from, from the lungs. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a lot of questions about the bead activity. So I think people are gonna have to go ahead and try that at home safely um, with adult supervision and all of the necessary safety gear, goggles, all of those things that you might need. Um, but beyond that, I think we are done to, for today. So thank you so much, Professor Shakashiri. I know we do still have some unanswered questions, um, but we are out of time for today. So I'd like to go ahead and invite you, Dr. Shakashiri, to say goodbye, any last few words you have, and then turn off your video for today. And, and enjoy experimentation. Uh, be safe in what you do. And whatever you do, keep thinking about how important it is for us to be responsible in protecting our planet uh, from, uh, from harm. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful to have you here today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in, being excellent scientists and sharing all of your observations and questions with us today. To see more programs like this, you can visit mos.org slash MOS at home. And if you've enjoyed today's program, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. And once again, if you'd like to have more science activities in your life, you can visit scifun.org to try out some more activities. Um, we do have a big mass STEM week celebration happening 
in about a half hour. So once again, visit our website, mos.org, if you'd like to join that celebration. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Shakashiri. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Keep asking questions, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.